Red Steel 2. Not at all following the events of the first game, a man goes on a quest. That of dying from friggin' heat exhaustion. Seriously, have you seen what he's wearing? Oh, and he's also avenging his clan, the Kusagari, but from his outfit, he's clearly putting more emphasis on the former. D dude, you're in the Nevada desert. His allies are Tamiko, the damsel in distress, the old sheriff, Steve Judd, Jian, who helped your clan and thus knows many of its secrets and can teach them to you, and Songan, a businessman. None of them particularly have any personality or backstory. You don't really connect with any of the characters in this. The worst case is, in fact, the character you're playing, who doesn't even have a name. His personality is just the quiet badass, and granted, he is a badass. But most of the time, they just don't refer to him at all, and near the end of the game, they do start referring to you by name, and they just call you Hero. And that's also how he's listed you know, in the credits, the voice talent. It frankly feels like halfway through, they realized, hey, we can't go the entire game without having someone refer to him. Does anybody have any good ideas for what to call him? Okay, we'll just call him Hero. Oh, they try to explain it away by apparently you've been banished from the Kusagari clan and they took away your name, but it's still kind of weak. Your allies always seem to have a new base in whatever area you're currently in. To an extent, you're free to move pretty much wherever you want in the area that you're currently in. It's sort of like the Grand Theft Auto games in that regard, and once you've completed all the missions in that area, you'll move on to the next area, and somehow your allies will already have a base there. These areas aren't necessarily particularly memorable. Let's talk about the overall look of this game. There's a joke in Murder by Death about how a Roman Catholic and an Orthodox Jew get married, and two hours later they get separated. Some things just don't go together. And the Wild West, the Ancient East, and futuristic technology may be among those things. The three feel like they're in competition with each other over the attention. You never fully feel like you're in the presence of the Wild West, the Ancient East, or a futuristic vision of the world of tomorrow. In fact, there are only a couple of places in this where it actually evokes the feeling of being in the Wild West, in spite of the moody electric guitar riffs and the distant wind. The quick draw isn't really smooth enough. You never slam open saloon doors. The length of the game is fine enough, but the ending and the overall game leaves you kind of cold. It feels uninspired. With all that said, Overall, I do still recommend this game, because the gameplay rocks. The main reason I bought the first one was because of the fencing. And while that aspect was okay, it was kind of limited. This is partially because it was such an early game. In fact, I believe Red Steel was a launch title for the Wii console. They weren't yet utilizing the full potential of the Wiimote nunchuck. What do I think of Red Steel 1 on the whole? It's okay. It's a decent enough first-person shooter with a sword that you occasionally get to use. If the sword isn't majorly important to you and you're just getting a first-person shooter for the Wii, I'd go with the Conduit instead. However, the fencing in Red Steel 2 is awesome. This is the second time I played a game using the Wii Motion Plus the first one being Avatar, and with this it worked much better. Every time you start the game up, just before you load, it asks you to calibrate, which you do by putting it on a flat surface with the A button facing down. Also, it seems to work better if the Wiimote pointer is not pointing towards the motion sensor. And granted, sometimes the calibration gets a little wonky. The pointer responds a little weird or when trying to do strikes, it gets them a little bit odd. However, I never lost a battle on account of that. And it auto-saves fairly often, so when you do die in the game, 
you don't lose too much progress. Anyway, this time around, it feels much more like it's mimicking your moves. I suppose it isn't entirely, but you really feel like you're the one delivering these blows. It is very responsive and quite intuitive. You can do a horizontal attack, a vertical one, a stab, and you can also do stronger ones of those. If you pull the arm back a little further and swing a little harder. The game tells you all of this and it trains you very well. With most of the things that John taught me, I was using them and with great effect very soon after. There are moves for all of the major danger situations and enemies. As you progress through the game you get tougher enemies that you have to fight in different ways. Although it is kind of a given that if you attack someone from behind you'll most of the time harm them much more and have a greater chance of actually breaking through their defenses than if you just attack them straight on. Pressing A sends you rushing towards an enemy and if you combine it with the control stake you can dodge thus easily getting out of the way of the enemy's attacks and possibly getting you behind them before they have a chance to turn around and face you. You can of course also strafe. Holding down a blocks enemy attacks including bullets. Note that the enemy can also do this and that some bullets come at you so fast that eventually you're not going to be able to block them all. And when enemies do particularly powerful attacks marked by the red glow, you can block either horizontally or vertically. And successfully blocking a series of attacks by the enemy leaves him slightly off his guard for a fraction of a second. If you stun an enemy, you can also finish them off by doing the attack you're prompted to do, where you'll, for example, stab right into them and then pull the sword out. If your enemy can't be stunned, you can take his health down enough. One way of stunning an enemy is shooting them in the knee. And this brings me nicely into the guns. There's only four of them. I'm, I'm not kidding, there's only four of them. You start out with one of them, soon after you can buy two more, and a little bit later after that, you can buy the fourth one. They can be upgraded. The guns are a revolver, an eight-shooter for some reason, a double-barrel shotgun, a Tommy gun, and a rifle. All of them in a sort of Wild West style. And note that in this game, you can use your sword anytime you want, and your guns anytime you want. Storytelling is typically through these pre-rendered first-person perspective scenes, but for some of the bigger events we also get full-blown, very attractive CGI. And these tend to be pretty memorable. The intro movie kicks ass, even though I don't know why they left him with his guns intact. Also early on in this game we get a kick ass, do the movement or press the button on the Wiimote that you're prompted to sequence. I don't know why they only did one. It was awesome. What can I say? Ubisoft just always seems to do fantastic gameplay. The graphics are quite good. We get this cell shaded style. Fire is ugly, but other than that, it looks pretty good. And the lighting is quite good. And not just for the console, except for when it really isn't very good. As you play this, you will instill great fear in the hearts of all vending machines, trash cans, barrels, and various other items that you can break in this game. Doing so gets you cash. You can also earn cash by doing missions, including the ones that are optional, and your cash is spent upgrading your katana, your four guns, your special moves, you can learn additional special moves, you can buy armor that'll absorb one hit per fight and then regenerate, which your health also does, you can extend your health, you can buy extra lives, and you can buy trophies that extend the amount of time during which you can execute a finisher. 
for example, meaning that you don't have to hurt the enemy as much before you get to do the finisher.